Coming up on the Mobile Content Creators Show. If somebody creates some content, they should get paid for it. You know, if a journalist produces a photograph or a video, they expect to be paid for it. How, how in any way is it acceptable if a journalist is standing on one side of the road and an eyewitness is standing on the other side and they fi film or photograph two angles of the same event? How is it acceptable to pay one and not the other? So the question today is, if you were at the scene of a news story and you shot footage on your mobile phone, who would you send that footage to and would you expect to get paid for it? Welcome to the Mobile Content Creators Show. If you're a mobile journalist, marketer or creative who makes content on a mobile device or for mobile audiences, you're in the right place. Keeping you up to date with the fast moving world of mobile, here's your host and mobile video specialist, Mark Egan. Today I'm joined by John D. McHugh, who's from Verify Media. Now, we'll be talking about the issue of having all these smartphones all over the world creating content, but do we know if we're a news organization whether this is legitimate content? Is this what it says it is? And that's a big problem, verifying the stuff that comes in. So John is from Verify Media, who look to be perhaps solving this problem. So John, thanks for joining us. Nice to talk to you today. Um, Let's kick it off first of all. Like, how did you get into this? What's your background? Is your background as a journalist? Yes, absolutely. Um, I have worked in media for nearly 20 years. Um, I spent almost 10 years covering the war in Afghanistan um, obsessively, some people might say. I spent very long periods of time out there. Um, I've also covered, um, worked in Iraq. Um, I've covered a couple of wars in Sudan. Uh, I've covered the Arab Spring and generally um, worked in lots of really nice, interesting places. Dangerous places, places from the sounds of it. <laughs> yeah, dangerous places. Yeah, yeah, I've had my fair share of uh, difficult times. And um, so now you're doing something slightly different uh, with Verify Media. Um, what is the problem you're trying to solve exactly? Towards the end of my time in Afghanistan, particularly, it became very, very difficult to move around the country. Um, I mean, if I was embedded with the military, that was one thing. There was one experience. But I, I also worked outside of the military sphere um, and would travel around Afghanistan with uh, one or two Afghan friends. And it became more and more difficult to do that um, just because the Taliban controlled more areas of the country. But there were more and more people offering me footage and um, video of events that had happened and, and quite often I knew it was true because I knew the people and I trusted them but that's not good enough you, you, you know you have to be able to actually verify information you know verification is a real buzzword at the moment but it's just fact checking it's old-fashioned journalism you've got to check your facts um, I also had an experience in 2011 I went into Bahrain at the start of the Arab Spring um, to try and make a film about what was happening there. Um, several of my colleagues had tried to go in a couple of days beforehand or over the sort of 48-hour period before I went, and they were stopped at the uh, airport, um, and most of them were uh, deported. So I decided to go in with no equipment because one of the key giveaways for us, unfortunately, is you turn up with a big bag of cameras and, you know, any X-ray machine in the world is going to pick it Whereas out. Everyone so has decided, a smartphone, of course. Absolutely. And so I decided to to go in with with no gear and um and to <laughs> basically see what I could do. And um look, it was a good idea and it worked. I got in. But what I hadn't anticipated was the level of um self-publication that was occurring in Bahrain. You know, I arrived and literally there were thousands of people who had their smartphones out and they were filming and photographing but more importantly they were publishing they were disseminating their own information where, where were they putting it out though so this is the this is the key to what we're doing they were pushing it out on twitter they were putting videos on youtube you know lots of stuff on facebook lots of stuff on whatsapp actually sharing information in sort of closed groups um and that content was being shared around. And I saw lots of really incredible, uh, very compelling content. But of course, immediately I looked at it and go, well, is that yours? Did, did you film that or did you get that from somebody else? And very quickly you could see the problem was nobody knew who had created this content. Um, they all knew it was essentially real because it was had been filmed in a small little area. So you could verify it sh just through sheer geographical awareness. I mean, you could look around and go, yep, that's Pearl Roundabout. Yeah, that's the shopping mall. There's the palm trees where the people got shot. So it's pretty straightforward. But to, to arrive and see people producing content, news, you know, new, sort of news gathering on that level was, was astonishing. In really simple terms, how does Verify Media work? I know there's an app. 
um, who can get the app and if they come across a story, what happens next? Verify Media is a technology-driven news agency. We have automated the verification, collation, distribution and licensing of verified eyewitness media. I talk about eyewitness media rather than UGC or user-generated content because I I feel that UGC is a holdover from a from an older era and eyewitness media is a much better definition of what we deal with. We deal with news reports that are created by people who are standing there and see it for themselves. They have the presence of mind to pull out a, a smartphone and document it. So we gather that, we verify it, and then we license it, and we split the money 50-50 with the contributors. The way we do that, the way we ask contributors to send stuff to us is by using our camera app. So we've built a camera app to gather content and a news wire to sell content. The camera app is on iOS only at the moment, so it's available in the App Store now. It's called Verified Media Pro Camera. It's free. Um, it's based on my experience of working with cameras for a very long time, but we didn't put any film or negatives in there. Um, but it's, it's it's meant to be a bridge. So it's quite a detailed professional camera. There are some very, you know, there's a there's a vast range of of solid features. In I mean, there. I, I I have to say I was quite surprised when I first got the app that actually as a just a pure camera app it's very impressive. Never mind the fact that it's attached to this whole other workflow. Um, actually, I thought yeah, this is a really nice, easy to use interface. Yeah, and it's look, it, we, you know, we've purposely used standard industry icons so any photographer or filmmaker who picks this up should immediately be able to work it out you know focus exposure color balance these are all standardized icons so it's very very simple the other beauty of this and it goes back to my dyslexia is that it um, transcends language so we don't have to have it translated into lots of different languages because any photographer anywhere around the world should be able to pick this up and use it immediately um, but we've also tried to keep it simple enough that if my mum tries to use it all she has to do is press the red button and it works and that was really important because we're talking about we represent freelance journalists and accidental eyewitnesses for us and, and not, not everybody agrees with this definition but as far as i'm concerned if you're an eyewitness if you produce eyewitness media it means that you were there now that might mean that you were uh, you're a professional journalist who, who's working you know in in um for example, last you know this morning we had footage in uh, from Chios Island in uh, in Greece and some horrific violence towards refugees there last night, and uh, we had content in from a, a freelance journalist and, and and we licensed it for for him. But we we've just as regularly had content in from uh, volunteers who work and live in the refugee camp in Calais. In fact, we've had more content. And we've sold more content from the what we call the accidental eyewitnesses, the people who live there, um, as opposed to journalists who've gone in and but, out and sent but stuff then to us. Getting on to some of the more tricky topics um, for journalism, uh, you know, some journalists may think, well, my job is being increasingly undermined <laughs> because anybody picks up a phone and suddenly they're a journalist. Um, and now, you know, John D. McHugh stepped into the arena and made it even easier with this fantastic app. Um, you know, could you argue that this is bad news for journalists? No, absolutely not. This is good news for journalists. Look, and I've said this before, and I sound like a, a university lecturer when I say this, but I really mean this. Journalism is not just about taking a photograph or recording a piece of video. Journalism is about, it's about gathering facts together. It's about analysing those facts. It's about distilling those facts down into a manageable and understandable story. And then it's about disseminating that story to an audience in a, in a reasonably engaging, informative and possibly even entertaining way. That's journalism. Taking a photograph and sticking it on, on Twitter, that's not journalism. It is sometimes news gathering. It's not always news gathering. Sometimes it's vanity or, or something else. Um, but taking a photograph, like again, you know, a lot of the footage that we deal with created by, by eyewitnesses, it is a document of an event that otherwise would not have been recorded because there were no journalists present. So give me an example. Give me an example of an occasion where, because you existed, something was gathered, was interesting and useful that perhaps would not have seen the light of day otherwise. So uh, um, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, 
um, during the clearance of the Calais camp, a uh, refugee camp, the jungle. Um, and there were lots and lots of journalists there. There'd been journalists there for days because it was a big event. And um, early one morning, and apparently most of the journalists were in bed, um, and riot police moved in early. It was about um, 7 a.m. in the jungle, so 6 a.m. here in the UK. And they... Um, started to forcibly remove some people. There was a pregnant woman and her husband uh, on the roof of a shelter and they said they were not going to come down and some riot police moved up to the side. They put a ladder up against the side and they charged up and swinging batons, they took the two people down. And one of our uh, contributors, who is a volunteer in the camp, was close by, uh, pulled out a smartphone, started the film and we got incredibly strong, upsetting, but important footage of two riot police battering a pregnant woman and there was no one else there to record that video that's why you know it ran on sky news and in the guardian right now you i mean we were both at MojoCon, um the biggest uh, mobile journalism conference uh, in the world in dublin it's another one's coming up very very shortly um you can see this is growing you know everybody's getting their yeah. phones are you noticing the quality of what's coming in improving significantly um partly because the phones are better but because people are getting more used to shooting video it used to be something only professionals did whereas now um people are shooting video routinely are you noticing an improvement in the quality from non-professionals yes absolutely there is there is more of an understanding out there of what works and what doesn't but also a part of it is you know the efforts that lots of us are making to educate people and to to say look if you know i mean i did it this morning i was speaking to somebody else and said you know tuck your elbows into your side when you film your footage would be so much better you know just 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 that little thing you know somebody said to me recently what is the single most important thing i need to know about filmmaking with a smartphone what is the one thing that will improve the footage that i shoot i said the most important thing when you take your phone out of your pocket is clean off your fingerprints and your pocket lint from the lens <laughs> good point yeah and the other <laughs> the other tip that people love is um like you and I are both wearing the kind of the hands free, the um, using this as a mic if you have nothing else, which uh, can be great. And where do you stand on the old um, vertical versus horizontal video debate then? <laughs> I stand very clearly on the side of sanity. And that says that we have two eyes in our head and they are either side of my nose. I see the world in a horizontal fashion and therefore the devices until very recently that helped me to view the world or view representations of the world were horizontal. That's why my TV screen looks like that. That's why my computer screen that I'm looking at right now looks like that. And I do not think that we should allow the technology tail to wag the dog and having our whole view of the world changed because we are using a device that is shaped to fit into our hand suddenly dictate how we see the world, to me, is nonsensical. However, the genie is kind of out of the bottle and people are making vertical video. Um, I think it's very sad. I think that I spend a huge amount of time saying to friends, relatives, neighbours, strangers that I see in the park, you know, if you turn your phone sideways, you're going to have a much nicer uh, video to watch on your computer screen or your TV in a few years. And they're like, yeah, but I only watch it on my phone. And yet, I do see people showing footage on their on their TV. I mean, I put people switch on AirPlay. Oh, hey, let me show you a video of little Johnny and what he did yesterday. And then I see, you know, a vertical video on a horizontal um, television. So I find that frustrating. Um, but like, the reality is, you know, Snapchat, whether or not it's Emperor's New Clothes and, and it remains to be seen, um, you know, is pushing this very, very hard. And there are few clients now that are asking if footage is available in vertical format right, okay. and yeah you know so, i could say it's, i could say to them learn how to crop it or i could say <laughs> yeah, of course we can provide that for you yes of course i know what you mean yeah my personal <laughs> take on it is um for very bite-sized bits of video i think vertical video is fine but anything you, you're going to watch for any length of time it gets quite frustrating to watch the vertical one. But, you know, maybe we'll be seen as old dinosaurs in a few years' time. Um, now, if I uh, turn up and there's, um, you know, um, an unfortunate disaster or, you know, uh, you know, God forbid, any kind of terrorist attack or some big, big story, um, why should I uh, take out my camera and shoot it and send it to you as opposed to, you know, at the end of every BBC news story on their website, it says, you know, 
were you there have you got any footage you know send it to us why should i send it to you and not to somebody like my former employer the bbc so quite simply we will make you money for your video um and to some people this is a dirty word it's a dirty concept oh you know you you're monetizing ugc i mean you know to be honest when i hear the term ugc i disregard everything else in the sentence but you know people will say that a lot um yeah we are we're, we're saying if somebody creates some content they should get paid for it you know if a journalist produces a photograph or a video they expect to be paid for it how how in any way is it acceptable if a journalist is standing on one side of the road and an eyewitness is standing on the other side and they film or photograph two angles of the same event how is it acceptable to pay one and not the other it, it isn't there's there's no argument that stands up to that scrutiny and then i've heard many journalists say yeah but it's really going to affect our business model you're goddamn right it's going to affect your business model because for far too long the media has taken advantage of people's naivety and said look we can get this content for free we can use it for free it's free it's it's free well it's not free and it shouldn't be free and the fact is that the the general public are becoming more and more savvy and aware that the reason that 200 people say, you know when they post a photograph some 200 journalists tweet them and say hey can we use your photograph for a credit hey can we use your video and we'll give you a byline and they're re working out well, if 200 people are chasing me for this, it must have some value. And, it, and of course, it does have value. We know it has value. Um, so if you t turn up to an event, and it doesn't always have to be a terrorist attack or a bus crash or something, the first video that we sold for uh, one of our contributors was from Ireland. It was um, the day of the, the vote counting after the same-sex um, marriage referendum in Ireland. And it was a girl going down on one knee and proposing to her partner. And it's, it's the most uplifting video and something that made me so proud of Ireland and made me so proud to be Irish um, and it made me really proud it was the first uh, piece of video that we sold because the truth is we do sell a lot of stuff that's horrible and, and you know people having tough times but I would say the, the simple fact is we will get you paid now there, there are some people who do not want to be paid there are some people who say I absolutely categorically don't want to make money from this footage or this photograph and we say that's fine well, we will still sell it to the, to our clients or license it to our clients. And you're a then, business at the end of the day. You need yeah, to keep the yeah, lights on. And, exactly. Yeah. We have costs, you know, in order to, to, to verify and distribute content. Um, but we will, we will, if somebody says they don't want to take the 50%, we can arrange for it to be donated to the charity. It's very easy to do that. Um, so, but it still means that a value is put on the content. And the other advantage to, to uh, contributors is if, particularly with, our, with, um, with witnesses. So, for example, I'm working with a, a woman in Sierra Leone who has survived Ebola and now wants to tell the story of her village because it's been decimated uh, by Ebola. And she could send that footage to the BBC or to somebody else who says, hey, please send us your footage. But then it's only going to one organization. It's only going to one outlet. By sending to to us, we can ensure that it goes out to a whole host of news organizations around the world and amplify the story that that person wants to tell. I'm very much with you on um, giving people a fair amount for what they've done, because I do know stories of situations where people, members of the public, have signed away footage for absolute <gasps> peanuts and yeah. they could probably buy a new house for what it was sold for. Um, and, you know, I agree with you. I think that's something which uh, isn't fair. I think uh, people do need to be made aware of if they do sign those, what the implications are of what they're doing. But um, when you do have people who sign up for you, um, do you give them any kind of training? Do they have something, um, sort of agreements they sign up to? What's the process? So somebody's uh, listening to this and thinks, you know what, I like the sound of that. What's the process? So it's very straightforward. Um, the app is free. You can download the app from the App Store and you need never have any contact with verif verified media. It's not, it's not, there's no binding arrangement. The app is free. It will always be free. And, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that it's a, a pretty cool camera app. If you want to take the next step and work with the agency, you go on to verifiedmedia.com and you sign up. There's not very much to sign, you know, give us your name, a profile photo, some other details, just so we can verify that you are who you say you are, and um, your PayPal details, because we pay people through PayPal. Um, 
we will pay our contributors within seven days. We usually pay people the next day, but we will pay within seven days, which is particularly attractive to freelance journalists because we've all spent, you know, vast swathes of our career chasing people for the money that we're owed. Um, so it's very straightforward. And we, I vet every single person who's admitted to our contributor list. I want to see people who are either freelance journalists or people who are living or working in a story that we think has real news value or somebody who has who displays a visual aesthetic which suggests to me that they're likely to contribute valuable content. We're not taking everybody and anybody. Um, you know, there, I have sometimes I will just shoot an email and, and clarify a few things. Sometimes I'll give a phone call and and, and chat a bit more. Um, but we're not just accepting everybody and anybody. Um, and is this worldwide? I mean, how 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 far do you spread? So we are. I think we have contributors in thirty eight or thirty nine countries right Fair now. Amount, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's pretty good. Look, we we are. We're restricted by language at the moment. Um, it's mostly English speakers or people who speak English as a second language. Um, we don't have uh, an Arabic speaker or a Spanish speaker or anything yet on the team. We only launched the app in the App Store, I think, four, three or four weeks ago. Um, and beta testing up to that point, a lot of it was done with uh, friends of mine because obviously I spent a long time working in the field. So you know, our, beta, our beta testing was was pretty hardcore. You know, It would be easy to test an app like this in London or Dublin or New York, but we had people testing it in Kabul and in, you know, in Yemen and in Sierra Leone and, um, you know, Nepal, the Nepal earthquake, you know, gave us a good, good run through our, our sort of... Uh, technical um requirements so and do, do you like you know if, if there are people in nepal or something do, do, have you given them a kind of like a tip sheet or something saying something happens we need shots this long mix of close-ups and wides i mean yeah do you do you give them much guidance we so the initial email when somebody signs up there's just some very basic information and it says you know what we're looking for you know ideally our shots you know between seven and ten seconds um you know it comes back to my sort of you know patented uh, um, teaching technique which is frame focus film so you know frame your shot up make a decision of what you're going to film in other words don't wave your camera and don't chase things around make a decision i want to film that so you frame it up then you focus and really when i say focus what i mean is set it so you know set your focus set your white balance set your exposure you know do whatever exposure compensation is required make your decision so you frame your shot you focus your shot and then film and basically what that means is you film you concentrate on your shot you do that for seven to ten seconds um and then that's going to give you usable content and what we want then is a, a selection of again my, my other sort of cheesy teaching line is if you want your video to have explosive impact you have to use wmds and i'm not talking about weapons of mass destruction i'm talking about wide mid-range and details and if we get three wide three mid-range three detail you know and then a couple of um either bits of interview or some actuality of the events that are happening it's very straightforward to pull together um, a news piece I mean, it's not something that's going to win awards it's, nobody's going to be going to the emmys um but it's about just giving them an understanding of what we, re we require but i also do a lot of live mentoring so we had um somebody who went to Yarlswood detention center uh, a few weeks ago there was a protest there and he'd never filmed anything before and he downloaded the app, he went along to the protest, he turned on auto-upload, which is a button on the left-hand side of our screen, and the idea, it's, so it's not live upload, it's not live streaming, um, we have some concerns about live streaming and security, um, and also uh, verification of events in real time. But what we allow, what, what you can do is you can upload automatically. So it means that basically you film something, as soon as you stop filming, that content starts to upload to us. So if you're in the middle of a breaking news situation, you're filming things, film, you know, start record, stop record, start record, stop record. You don't then want to have to faff around in the library and say, oh, let me find, um, you know, where's that, where's that, oh, should I send that one or should I send that one? So we had somebody who went to a protest. He turned on auto upload. And so everything that he filmed was coming into me. And I'm not going to lie, and I've told him this, so it's not, you know, going to upset him or anything, but the first few bits of video I got were junk. They were just crap. It was, again, a classic, oh, I just... So you, you've seen my work then, yeah. 
<laughs> but you know he um yeah so i saw these things i was like what on earth is this so quickly you know jumped on my laptop and just sent a message hey look great to see you're out in the field and you're covering something um you know i just want to bring you back to the uh, frame focus film you know be deliberate take your time take a breath don't try and capture everything in one shot you know we, we've got time and um he sent me some more things to through and they were better and i was like okay this is better and i went back to him again it's like okay now think about your composition you know there's people letting off smoke grenades you know how's that going to, what's the light in the background you know, just think about these things so i'm not telling them what to do we don't commission people i'm not saying i'd like a shot of this or i'd like a shot of that but giving because, the framework to work within yeah because i mean yeah. there are universal rules aren't there it's like you say about not moving the camera around all over the place and holding shots for a period of time i'm always amazed because you know um when i've done training just the fact that the difference between somebody who knows nothing and somebody who knows that the the kind of tips you're talking is massive. Um, massive. It's and I think I'm amazed that every news organisation hasn't trained every single person in their building, not just the journalists, but the you know the people on reception, whatever. Because if something happens, you don't know who will be there, and there's no yeah. good saying well we've tra- trained our chief reporter because they may not be the one at the scene. It may be you know, the person who works in the canteen, you know, so uh, well, I, I fully I, believe it's it's becoming a base skill that everybody should learn. It should, absolutely. And I can exclusively reveal here in this interview that I am nearly finished filming a full uh, film school um, where I'm going to show people, or I am showing people, all of these basics, all of the things that we take for granted in a series of video tutorials, and I'm going to put them online for free. Okay. Because I think that absolutely everybody should have access to this information. Now, I spoke to a friend of mine recently, who was a photographer, who got a little bit irate at me, and said, uh, you know, like, what are you doing? You know, blah, blah, blah. I said, look, if I stand in front of a building that's on fire, and somebody stands beside me, even if we have the same iPhone, if we have the exact same rig, I have nearly 20 years experience. I better produce something that stands above the eyewitness or the, the, you know, the person who's standing beside me. I know you're a busy man and there could be a story breaking right now, so I probably need to get you back to work. But just to finish up, I mean, like I say, MojoCon is coming up in Dublin, um, you know, bigger and better than last year. Um, you can see that this movement of people creating content on smartphones is growing. Where do you think it's going? Like five years from now, 10 years from now, what are the trends that you're seeing? Gosh, that's a, that's a tough question, Mark. Um, I think that it's, look, I, I look at my, um, I have a daughter who's five and a half and she can make films. I'm certain she can shoot films. She will take my phone out of my hand and she will go in and film her sister playing with Lego or dancing. And, and then she sells she, it to verify, right? <laughs> well, yeah, well, but she will genuinely, she will look, go in and she'll get some wide shots, some GVU, GVs, and then she'll move in and she'll change her angle and get some mid-range shots. I've seen her look around at the light and consider where she's going to shoot. She's five and a half. Um, and okay, she's got me around and I shoot a lot, but she's learned from that. But lots and lots of other kids are doing this. It's just, it is just another skill that they have it's completely normalized for them and i find that very exciting you know i've said you know for a long time you know everybody who has a smartphone is a potential news gatherer now i'm not saying they're potential journalists that's a different as we discussed earlier it's a different concept but they're potential news gatherers and that's a great thing that's an incredibly exciting thing so many times in my career i've turned up in time to photograph or film the smoke but I've missed the raging fire. But now we have, you know, billions, apparently two billion smartphones, but that'll be out of date by the time you edit this piece. Um, but, you know, we have all of these people in the world who have smartphones and we have a generation coming up who are as used to using a smartphone as they are to using a knife or fork or chopsticks um, or their fingers. Um, but my point is that it's become it's just it's just completely normalized. And so the ability to document events around us increases. But what that brings into news and I come at this from from sort of as a publisher now, I guess, is the excitement of the, the possibility of not only covering the big stories of our day, but the hyper-local opportunities, the, the, the ability for communities, most of whom have lost their, their local newspapers, have, have the ability now to know what's happening in their own little community and, and for people to be able to 
not only document that, but to have it verified so that other people believe it. I think that's very exciting. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I've been into some big news agencies and the number of people they throw at having to try and verify stuff coming in, you know, people sitting around who are experts on Syrian dialects, you know. Um, so in a sense, you know, um, even though they may have to pay for your content, it may possibly economically make sense in the long run. Absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, that's a really critical point. And I didn't want this to turn into like a sales pitch. I've tried to sort of stay away from, you know, I want to give you the, 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 the basics, but you're absolutely right. I've said this many times. People, you know, we go to clients and say, well, that, that's very expensive. It's very expensive compared to what? What's your frame of reference? You know, well, we usually wouldn't pay for this content. We get it off social for free. So, but it's not free because you're paying a huge team and you're paying for offices and it's still slower. You know, you try and find a piece of content online, work your way backwards, find who created, work out the dialect. You know, it's it's slow. It's expensive. It's not always successful. I know how this industry works and I'm not interested in building a news agency that has hundreds of journalists. I want a news agency that has hundreds of thousands of eyewitnesses around the world. All right. Well, very interesting concept. I think you sit quite interestingly between the kind of, you know, citizen journalism, you know, freelance journalism, established news brands, and like you say, the eyewitnesses who just whip out their phone. Um, and it's quite an interesting way of pulling it all together. But at the end of the day, if we're getting good information, that's always good for public interest, for democracy. Um, so I wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much for your time. And um, don't forget to check out the app, see what you think about yourself. And um, John D. McHugh, I will see you over a, a pint of Guinness in Dublin in the near future at MojoCon. I'm looking very much forward to it, Mark. Thank, thank you for your time. Thank you. If you like this podcast, don't forget to subscribe. And we'd love it if you would leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. To get in touch with Mark, go to www.purplebridgemedia.com or tweet him at Mark Egan Video.